welcome Peter to the Lisa podcast where we go inside addiction to raise your level of consciousness. Um, so I just wanted to start by yeah, introducing you as you've studied personal development for many, many years um, and I feel like the lens that you have in terms of addiction would be very beneficial to a lot of our audience. So just to sort of start off, how would you kind of define addiction? Uh, addiction is something that's a, a well you keep drinking from. Yeah, and that is irrespective of whether what you're drinking from the well is doing you good or not doing you good. Uh, it's, a, it's an overriding compulsion to continue a certain behavior that is essentially you know, bypassing the, uh, the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, it's essentially allowing you to uh, be what I call sleeping awake. And it's a choice that's made without a, a lot of association much of the time to the consequences of continuing that choice. Yeah, it's a behavior that owns you rather than you owning the behavior. Yeah, and why would you say like some of that behavior is caused like in the first place? Well, it's all down to needs. Now, we do certain behaviors because they meet our needs. If they didn't meet our needs, we wouldn't do them. So where most people go wrong when it comes to addiction is that they focus on the behavior and not the needs. So if you have a, uh, let's, let's take a, a classic example. You have a typical drug addict, uh, somebody who is addicted to um, uh, the highs uh, of uh, cocaine or the opiates of heroin or whatever it may be. And uh, they are getting certain needs met from that addiction. For example, one could be, uh, it's what we call secondary gain. You know, they get the initial high from the drug, but that's usually you know, compensated by a big low. But what else do they get? You know, the secondary gain aspect to that is you know, they get significance, right, because they have a big problem. And that may sound strange, but a lot of drug addicts that I've worked with are more addicted to the connection that they get from people running around them making excuses or trying to help or yeah, uh, giving them um, attention, etc., than they are the actual drug itself. Uh, they, yeah, they get certainty. They know how they're going to feel. They get variety. It gives them a state change, you know, to escape a lot of the stuff they don't want to deal or face within in the yeah, the outer world. Uh, it's um, uh, it gives them, uh, as I say, some of them sense of significance. Yeah, I don't have a degree, I don't have a PhD, I don't have any qualifications, but I have a really you know, uh, big drug problem. I, I'm somebody with that. Uh, and my first question when I'm working specifically with, with drug addicts is, who are you without your problem? Because many people have failed to ask that question or at least follow it through. And what I'm addressing there is the secondary gain. Yeah, a lot of them are tired of waking up in their own sick. A lot of them are tired of going inside for petty crime to try to fund a habit that they, you know, ideally wish they didn't have. And consciously, you know, they're intelligent people. Yeah, it makes sense. I don't want to continue this, but I feel trapped. And a lot of that is because they haven't actually figured out who they are without their problem. And if you want to see an area where people are driven unconsciously more than any other aspect of, you know, uh, of life, it's in the area of identity. So who you are without your problem, uh, well, you know, I don't know, is the answer to you know, that question for most people, if it's a big problem, if it's an addiction. Yeah, or it, and again, it, anger can be an addiction. Yeah, alcohol can be an addiction. Yeah, it's, yeah, there, there's different levels, different categories. So, but sticking with the drug aspect, you know, if somebody is uh, um, getting their needs met, not just on the actual feeling of the drug, but on all of the other stuff that comes behind it as secondary gain. If you're trying to change the behavior, let's say you put them in rehab, without then re-fulfilling those same needs that are being met, they will go back to that behavior in order to get the needs met. So you're not treating the actual addiction to the drug. You're treating the addiction to the needs that the drug is actually meeting. And unless you find a more empowering way for those needs to be met, then the drug is they're going to go back to. And that's the classic rehab yo-yo. Yeah. And how would you say, um, so you have these needs and once these needs are met um, sort of without the drug, then effectively, would you say the user would then stop using the drug? No need for it. 
And what would some of these needs be? You said about like the need for love and connection. So all the family are typically enabling, running around and trying to like support this person, even by sending them rehab to rehab. How do, how do you see that perspective of the impact and need for the other people? Yeah, so, yeah. And again, lo love and connection are two different needs. Yeah, most people want love, but they settle for connection. And for somebody who's lonely because they've got low self-esteem, they don't like themselves in the mirror, they don't, um, you know, they don't have many decent friends that would be there at two in the morning if they needed them, all that kind of stuff, a lot of them use drugs to connect with themselves. But then, yeah, it's a spiral because, they, you know, again, they don't like who they are in the mirror. So they'll settle for low levels of connection, usually with other people that have similar problems. So if you can replace that with a family that's non-judgmental or friends that you know, have your best interests at heart, it starts with you. There needs to be a willingness. If there's no willingness, then there's no help. And I'm a great believer, I'll be honest, that you know, I have no right to change anybody. Some people are born to star in the movie of their choice, and that choice is sometimes a warning, not an example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and because we were out of a sense of caring, because we want to be able to help people and we don't want to see them in pain, yeah, if you're a you know, half-decent human being, uh, we tend to run around, oh, let's help him, let's try and get him up. And, and some people, it ain't their path. Now, if you've got someone who's willing to, to change, but they don't know, have the resources and they don't have the how, that's a whole different game. I'll be there for that person 24-7. But somebody who's using somebody else to try to help them because it, it uh, they know that, well, if I don't say I want help, no one's actually going to give me any attention. But then when they come off the drugs, it's like, oh, now who am I? I don't have anyone running around trying to help me anymore. So therefore, I go back to being a, a drug addict. And again, a lot of this isn't conscious. A lot of this is unconscious. You know, we, we lift our fork up to our mouth when we're eating unconsciously. Uh, the, the needs will drive the behavior. It's not like you're sitting there thinking, Oh, well, yeah, uh, let, let me let me do a you know, SWOT analysis on whether I should be a drug addict or not. <laughs> right? Not, yeah. That's not going on. So, yeah, if, if you understand that you know, willingness is, is, the, is the key part, and sometimes you can engineer that. Uh, it's not something I do very often, but you, know, you, you can engineer that with leverage. You know, if, a lot of the time people won't do as much for themselves as they'll do for others that they care about. Especially if you've got kids. Uh, if you, yeah, you can live with being the identity of a loser uh, and not care what people think. But living with the identity of being a bad father usually hits people at a different place. Uh, that they won't stand for. Because now the imposition is that their actions are affecting other people that they care about, that they don't want to see suffer. And it's triggering the primary fear that we all have, which is the fear we're not enough. And you tie that to an identity like being a bad dad or a bad you know, parent, a bad brother, bad whatever it is. Yeah, and you start to be able to motivate people more than yeah, getting off the couch and doing it for themselves. Yeah, so I think that's like a really interesting point. And one thing I learned from you is you have like an intellectual level of understanding. You know, if you do drugs, that's bad. And then you reach like an emotional level of understanding. Like you say, you become... Uh, or if someone says to you, you do another drug, you'll die, you may enter into like an emotional shift. But to create yeah. real change, you need to change your identity. But what you're saying, if I'm hearing correctly, is that you can create a situation for someone where you allow their emotions to dictate the identity they currently have, and that may help them shift and want to change their identity from an emotional place, so then they could outlast using the emotional shift to get to the identity shift of being not an addict, for example. You're a good student, Luke. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah no, great, great level of understanding. And again, there's, nothing's ever black and white. Yeah, everything's more than fifty shades of grey. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we we have to understand that it's a dynamic process because you're dealing with a dynamic entity called a human being. Yeah. And what may work for somebody may not work for somebody else. Yeah. So one has, as a practical psychologist, as a you know practical therapist. One has to understand that there's a lot of factors that are constantly in motion and, you, and our job, if we were really trying to help people authentically, is to seek out what is it that you know, is the most beneficial, what serves this person at their highest level in this particular point. And sometimes it's to walk away. Some people need to hit their head a little harder on the pavement before they realize you know, they get the lesson. Yeah. yeah. Or tough love, as we call it.
Uh, and there's that there's several people that you know, I've worked with that's yeah, and uh, caregivers of people that you know that, that I work with that you know and I've said listen yeah if, if you want it more for someone than they want it for themselves you're wasting your time and some people are here as I say to be a warning not an example we're not here to save the world nor do we have any right to our right is to be the invitation for somebody to step up and provide the resources if they have the willingness but they don't have the res- uh, you know have the resources or the strategy to be able to do it or the, or the support system in place while being mindful that we're not fulfilling any secondary gain inadvertently. Yeah, and one of the things you say is, uh, or I've heard you say at the MBS, I believe, is that you can't let other people's candles, you can only shine so bright all those around you spontaneously combust. Um, Absolutely. And I really love that quote, but I think a lot of the family members and people that are around um, addiction, they get caught up in that trap and they sort of try and light the other person's candles and they forget about themselves and they're in their own whole process of denial. So and their own sense of identity. Um, so how do they like sort of solve those problems on that level? Everything's reflective of your own level of consciousness. You know, yeah. There's a there's a great um, section in, in you know, one of my favourite books, Power versus Force, uh, where yeah, the late great Dr. David Hawkins uh, delineates a lot of the the different aspects of how people see the world, and he gives the example of of a, a bum or a drug addict on the street. Yeah, and if you're coming from a place of, you know, a low level of consciousness, you're going to see that as yeah, potentially threatening. Yeah, or you're going to see it as disgusting, or you're going to see it as like, you know, not your problem. Yeah, if you're coming from a higher level of consciousness, you're going to see it from a place of, you know, maybe a willingness to help, maybe you know, uh, something that you can do to support it. If you're coming from a yeah, an intellectually high level, maybe you know, this is a systemic of a social problem that you want to you know, devote some time into trying to solve at a, at a wider level. Yeah, at the highest level of conscious, you see it maybe as uh, as a person who's completely broken free from the bondage of society and is living a, a life that you envy. <laughs> yeah. You know? It's it's a, a completely different aspect. But the important thing to note here, coming back to your original question, is we can only ever project onto the world our own sense of meaning that is reflective of the level of consciousness we're at. Uh, so yeah, if the family members are coming from a level of consciousness where they're driven by guilt, duty, or obligation, then they're always going to pour petrol on the deal yeah, inadvertently. They're always going to try to yeah, solve the problem of the behavior without recognizing what they're really trying to do is fulfill their own needs, uh, to avoid their own fears, to justify their own position yeah, in the family. And again, yeah, you, you can care somebody uh, or sorry, care for somebody at, at, a, you know, at a deep level and do what's right, but at the same time, I have a willingness to understand that they're on their journey. Now, it doesn't mean say you make it worse for them, but you know, there's a certain point where you know that member of the family that's got the problem will start to lean on this. I had the same conversation last night. On a, I have a, a high-level coaching group called the Master Circle, and uh, we get on a, a video call each week. And one of the members yesterday was explaining how. Yeah, she had a, a, an issue with her son, and yeah, he's you know, running very negative patterns, you know, in and out of you know, different places, and you know, stealing from his mom and all the rest of it. Yeah, you know? and she keeps going back to support him. She keeps throwing him out, and then keep letting him back. And it's a pattern. And at a high level of consciousness, which you know the master circle is, it's otherwise I wouldn't let you be a part of it. Yeah, uh, I explained that this is not about him. This is about her attracting her lessons to avoid the fear she's not a good enough mother, right, through linking her sense of self-worth through external validation on how she treats her son. Because she's like, oh, well, if he then goes out and does worse, I'm, I'm, it's my fault for not you know, being there for him. Well, there's only so much you can do so many times before somebody has to you know, uh, learn their own lessons. You know, what, what, would giving a cocaine addict more cocaine support them? Or you know, do you let them go cold turkey or bang their head against the wall? Uh, interesting question and again there's no black and white but in that situation because it's so repetitive for her I said clearly the lesson here is it's not about him this is about you and at a high level of awareness you'll realize that once you pass that exam in life in earth school his behavior may likely change because you're likely manifesting it in a way that's there to give you the graduation event that you need to stop judging yourself as a mother by the behavior of your son in terms of the patterns that he's running yeah, and I think it comes back to also this need for love and connection 
that's also like the enablers need for love and connection as well. They're enabling because they want that low level of connection at some level as well. It's it, yeah. It's to avoid the fear that they're not enough. Yeah, as, as a caregiver. And you know, what's interesting when you you talk about drugs or alcohol stuff like that, people tend to get high. And the problem with the addiction here, and this is a high level of understanding, but I'll share it with you and your, your listeners because I'm sure yeah you know, they're tuned in. Where most people make the mistake is that they think the drug gives them the high and therefore they link the drug to the high and become addicted to the high, therefore addicted to the drug. But that's not actually what's going on. At a level of consciousness and physiology, biochemistry, what's actually happening is what the drug is doing. It's removing the inhibitions that are allowing you to reach those states of consciousness. The state of consciousness is natural. It's not caused by the drug. The drug moves out of the way, the blocks to it. So if you learn how to remove those blocks yourself, you don't need the drug. So I'll never take drugs. No, don't need to. Why? Because you know, I've worked hard on removing the blocks that allow me to access levels of joy, bliss, unconditional love yeah, through yeah, deep inner work and meditation and, and, and different aspects of personal growth. Why would I ever need a drug to try to help me get there when I'm already there? It's like taking steroids in the gym versus lifting the weights. A lot of people would prefer to take the steroids thinking it's the, you know, uh, that's the way to grow muscle. No, the way to grow muscle is to go lift the weights. And if you do the work, you don't need steroids. But a lot of people either don't aren't aware of what work they need to do or they, they, they mistakenly think that, oh, the only way to get, um, yeah, uh, uh, grow muscle is through taking steroids. The only way to get high is through doing drugs. No, drugs and high don't go together. Yeah, Drugs and removing blocks to your high go together. And then you experience the high that you have because you don't have those low level states of guilt, shame, anger, frustration, yeah, and all the stuff people are trying to escape with. Yeah, and what would you say would be some of the ways to rebuild those blocks in a sense of ways that aren't drugs that, that people could learn or do to do that hard work? Well, the, the first step in crossing you know, the, 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 the river is to start accepting responsibility for everything in your life. When I say everything, I mean everything. Yeah, and I'm, I'm talking um, yeah, the good things, the bad things, the indifferent things, yeah, all, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and so yeah, once you can accept risk personal responsibility and stop blaming, stop pointing fingers, stop arguing with the world, Stop trying to you know, fix everything that doesn't fit your pictures. You start to empower yourself at a very different level. And again, that's if that was easy, everyone would do it. But most of the time, we're conditioned by society not to think that way. It's not empowering. So yeah, from, from that side, yeah, our role here is to yeah, work on ourselves piece by piece. And Buddha wasn't born enlightened. Yeah, it's, it's a journey. And for some of us, definitely not this lifetime. Some of us, maybe not the last several lifetimes. Yeah, and that's okay. Now, it's direction of travel. What you don't want to be doing is backsliding or spinning your wheels. Yeah, move forward an inch at a time. Yeah, if you're taking, uh, I, I don't like to use the, the, the drugs as an example here because yeah, a lot of people like, try to cut down. Same with smoking. The problem when you try to cut down on smoking is it doesn't work. Why? Because people think it's a habit. It's not. It's an addiction. And the natural tendency for an addiction is to always increase, not decrease. So therefore, trying to cut down yeah, on your smoking habit is always destined to be futile right? yeah, for the vast majority of people. So yeah, doing the work on ourselves, the first step, accepting total responsibility. Yeah, not the fact that your boss sacked you because he's an idiot. No. Right? You attracted the situation called I've been fired for whatever reason. Even if you're a great employee of the month, you probably attracted it to go find a better boss that appreciates you. Accept that. Yeah, so being able to move from that place is the starting point of, say, taking you know, self-responsibility. And therefore, we're on a path then that allows us to have higher states of, of you know, joy and, and, and being and, and less stress, less frustration. The problem is that in, at low levels of awareness, low levels of consciousness, we tend to learn more from pain than pleasure. Sometimes we need the kick in the pants. Yeah, we need to be fired. We need to wake up in our own sick. We need to you know, have our family say, that's it, I'm cutting you off, whatever it is, in order to wake up. 
at a high level of consciousness, we don't tend to have as many problems around uh, that are pain related. Instead, we learn, you know, life decides that you, know, you can learn from you know, more pleasurable stuff. But that doesn't happen for people at, at the lower levels, unfortunately. Okay, so to get to these higher levels of consciousness, what would you require? Any like practical tips, such as like meditation or any like practical psychological interventions? It's it's yeah. You know, surround yourself with good information. The first thing I'd recommend people do is go read Power versus Force, because that delineates it in a way that makes it practical. Yeah, if you if you can't get on with that, the first quarter of the book's a little heavy. It, it delves into you know, chaos theory, nonlinear dynamics, applied kinesiology, you know, quantum physics to give a reference for this because consciousness is nonlinear. That's why most people don't understand it. Yeah, when Einstein said, yeah, you can't solve a problem at the same level of thinking or consciousness that you know, created the problem, he was bang on. But most people don't understand what he meant. Yeah, and there's a difference between being a victim uh, because I'm blaming everything and everything happens to me as opposed to being an achiever and saying, you know something, I'm not relying on anybody else anymore, I'm going to go make it happen. Uh, the two different mindsets. Getting in line with the higher levels of life where things start to flow, it's a different mindset. Becoming a spiritual teacher and master is a different mindset. But it's part, it's part of the journey of growth. Yeah, you don't blame a kindergarten yeah, kid for failing social economics. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, where we yeah. are on a journey. But power versus force, taking responsibility. Meditation is great. Uh, but most people don't understand it. Um, most people have no clue. Most people struggle with meditation. They think it's about trying to get to a Zen place where you know there's no thoughts and that doesn't happen because the mind is overstimulated and is always talking. So meditation is simply about what I call there's two types. There's active and passive. Passive meditation is the first step. And that's not about having no thoughts. It's about separating your sense of who you are from your thoughts. Because who you are is not your mind. You have a mind, just like who you are is not your body. You, know, you have a body, but if I was to cut your arm off, you'd have 15% less body, but you wouldn't have 15% less language or memory or you know, you know, personality. So who you are clearly isn't your body. It's the same with the mind. Uh, the moment you feel most alive is where the mind is not engaged, staring at a sunset making love to your partner, holding somebody's hand, yeah, looking at a piece of artwork that takes your breath away. The mind's silent, but you feel alive. So meditation is about being able to get to a state where, you know, if the mind's down there chatting away, you almost observe it. Yeah, you're in a different place, and eventually you'll ignore it, and it'll it'll quiet down. And it may pipe up again and quiet down, but you're not associating, you're not processing the thoughts by identifying them as yours, as who you are. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. And if you do that, you can calm down. You get in touch with more the metaphysical, the non-physical side of life, which is far more real yeah. than the physical side. Yeah, physical side is an illusion. Yeah, and I think that's extremely beneficial, um, or I've found meditation extremely beneficial in the sense that when you start to become an observer of your thoughts and you realise, yeah, you are not your thoughts, um, you can then sort of understand the thoughts you have about sort of taking drugs or having those addictive behaviours, if you like, that... Um, yeah, so when you're having those addictive behaviors, you can recognize it as a thought and just think, this is my mind thinking an addictive thought, and I'm not that thought, and I'm not like sort of an addict, or those thoughts linked to that sense of identity of being an addict, but I'm working consciously in this present moment on building my new sense of identity. So those addict thoughts, I'll let go for the time being, while I move my consciousness forward to a place of a new sense of identity such as becoming an entrepreneur or finding more meaning or providing value or rearranging your needs, for example, those thoughts like um, serve the needs of sort of certainty and of love and connection. But I am letting those thoughts go and I'm working towards more growth and contribution and that's where my conscious attention will, will go. Does that make sense? Bang on. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's not a journey that everybody can take or is willing to take. But you make a great point because the body gets conditioned to certain levels of biochemistry. Yeah, the cells have receptor sites on the outside. And so uh, let's use a, a simple example of coffee, but you can apply it to anything. So if you continue to drink coffee, you essentially engineer a high cortisol-based environment, a high stress-based environment, because it, it kicks the adrenals and caffeine you know, stimulates um, adrenaline, stimulates cortisol. Yeah, and you have a acidic high um, stress environment inside the body. 
Now, what happens is the cells are swimming around in the soup. Their interface with the outside world is done on receptor sites on the outside of the cell. And imagine that the cell basically the, is you know, on the beach and you know, the environment around it is the weather. Now, the clothes that that cell is going to wear depends on the weather. It's going to adapt. So if it's going to be cold, they're going to be wrapping up. If it's going to be hot, they're going to be you know, wearing swimming costume. You with me so far? Yeah. Right? So if you drink or eat or think certain thoughts, because every thought creates a chemical, that creates the weather in your environment, that conditions your cells to a certain wardrobe, Let's say you keep taking coffee or cocaine or whatever it is or heroin or whatever, and the cells get addicted, and you have 50 trillion cells that are saying, whoa, yeah, I'm wrapping up warm because the weather's cold in here. You then decide, I want to quit. I'm going to change. I don't want to be an addict anymore. I'm moving forward. Nature operates on a certain law that is called path of least resistance. In other words, nature doesn't waste energy in vain. We know that through basic electricity. You know, the electricity, electric circuit will always take the short circuit. Yeah. Uh, we don't know how, we don't know why, we don't know the fact it runs around and measures all the alternatives. Um, and No, it just does. It's just part of the rule set. So if, our, if we've got 50 trillion cells that are used to you thinking negative thoughts and taking drugs, and therefore they're wearing their winter clothes... They've adapted and modified their entire receptor sites to being a high cortisol environment and did that. You would adapt if you were like in a sunny environment and you decide you want to change the weather. Yeah, you want to be sunny. You, you don't want to be you know, um, thinking negative thoughts anymore and taking you know, substances that don't support you. What happens is that that conscious thought goes in and starts to change the blood chemistry into a different weather pattern. Yeah? Yeah. At which point, nature takes the path of least resistance, and it's got two paths that it can choose. It can choose to have 50 trillion cells change their entire wardrobe, or it can tell you to change the weather back to what it's, there, what it's used to. Which do you think it tries first? Tries, yeah, to force you back to what you're used to. And what that, because nature takes the path of least resistance. And what happens at that level is that you start manifesting self-talk that is not you. It's the voice of 50 trillion cells saying, look, take another hit. You really want us to go change 50 million wardrobes when all you need to do is change the weather back? Dude, come on. Yeah, just one more hit, just one more cup of coffee, just one more you know, smoke, whatever it may be. And at that point, if you don't separate yourself from the self-talk, you start beating yourself up, thinking it's about you. Oh, I don't have willpower. But if you turn and say, oh, look, there's my body doing what I know it was going to do. It's asking me to change the weather back to what it wants. Well, not this time. I only need about a couple of weeks three weeks before the cells start having to adapt to a different environment and they'll start changing their wardrobe. And then you have 50 trillion cells supporting you. See, people say to me, says, can you be happy all the time? I said, well, pretty much. Why? Is your life so amazing? No, my life's full of more problems and challenges than most drug addicts. Well, how can you be yeah, so happy all the time? Well, seriously, a few reasons. One, I tried being unhappy once and I didn't like it. Yeah, don't complicate it. No, the second is this. I've got 50 trillion cells in my body that are used to a, you know, doing a happy dance. Yeah, because I think thoughts that create oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine, not thoughts that you know, think uh, or, or create yeah, cortisol yeah, or yeah, um, uh, adrenaline or stress hormones. No. So if I start thinking a negative thought, what do you think happens to my cells? Dude, what are you doing? Pull yourself out of this. Right? We're not changing our wardrobe for some crappy <laughs> set of clothes. We're, we like being on the beach for the sunshine. Come on, dude. Blow away the clouds. You can do it. Now I have an entire army in my corner. So whenever, you know, do I get down? 
occasionally, but how long does it last? Virtually seconds. Why? Because I've got an army on my side. Yeah. It just takes conditioning. Yeah. And I think some of the things I've learned from you um, of how to condition those, um, yeah, those sort of like, um, yeah, army of soldiers, if you like, is things like the gratitude list. Um, you said about writing a list of all the things you're grateful for and continuing that lift for, list for a lifetime. So you slowly start to condition your brain to see, um, yeah, the gratitude or the magic moments list. Try to recognize the magic moments throughout the day um, and throughout your life and make note of them and come back to them when things aren't so down and you're still fighting the battle with conditioning those soldiers and say, look, this is all the grateful things that have happened and let's think, so, think of some more while, they're here, while we're here. I don't have to be massive things, but you're slowly over the years and over the weeks and months, you slowly program, like you say, those soldiers to, to do what you like. Yeah, 100%. And again, with that kind of army, I can go in, as you probably know, into almost any situation uh, and, and still maintain a level of calm, equanimity, happiness, even joy. Uh, some of the you know, toughest places that people don't want to go. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're at the, so we've gone to kind of the top of, of where you want to be. But so if we reverse a bit and go to the bottom, so someone's an addict, they're down, they've got all of this stuff going on. How do they create like a compelling vision of where they want to go that may help them step into that new experience of who they are? First thing is, yeah, set yourself up to win if you can. Yeah. Environment is everything. I told you, you're, you're, the, the body will adapt to its thoughts. Well, we are 24-7 adaptation machines. Yeah? Your body will adapt to its environment, whether you put it in the gym or whether you put it in McDonald's. It, it doesn't care. It will adapt. Its job is to change to suit the environment, just like the cells will change to suit the inner environment. Your mind is exactly the same. If you hang around with 10 recreational drug users, you're likely going to become the 11th. If you hang around with yeah, 10 people that are, are seeking and willing to try to change and, and yeah, better themselves, you'll likely become the 11th. So the first practical thing you can do is question your peer group. You know, I worked with a guy uh, last year, Oliver, bless him. Uh, we got him off methadone. Yeah, he had a lifetime crack addict, wrote me a beautiful letter and uh, was doing really, really well, but went back to the environment where his partner was a user. I can already predict what's going to happen. And the guy won't talk to me now because he thinks he's let me down uh, and he's struggling. But what chance you got? You're dealing with you know, millions of years of evolution. We're designed to adapt to our environment. So you go into an environment where the person you're getting your connection from yeah, is using heroin, right? and you're, you're, you just come off it, but you don't want to lose that connection to them, and you don't want to, yeah, uh, and you start associating to, to their excuses or what have you. It's a one-way ticket. Yeah, you've got to give yourself a shot, change your peer group, and he, he would have had to have walked away, and he didn't have the resources to do that because yeah, he wanted the connection from, for her. But yeah, that's just part of the part of the process. Yeah, change your peer group, change your environment. Don't expect to change if you don't have an environment that supports that. So that's the first step. Second step is you're making a decision, right? Yeah, what is it that I want? Where do I want to go? Everything is possible. Yeah, the law of quantum mechanics states that a new future is always available. So yeah. Choose, write it down, get a vision, get excited, get something that excites you. Forget the how, the how's none of your business. The how will present itself uh, at the moment that you're ready to, to make the decision. And uh, if you've got a decent environment, you're taking many steps. Don't expect it all to happen overnight, but you know, one foot in front of the other. And in terms of, you know, if, if you, you say your peer group, if you're like addicted almost to that love and connection you get from the peer group that's at that low level of consciousness, the same as you, how do you embrace the level of uncertainty from such a primary need of unconditional love or it's probably conditional love at that level of consciousness? But from that level, how do you embrace letting go of that level of like conditional love, embrace the uncertainty to hopefully build a future in which you gain the love that you desire? It requires courage. Courage is the first step towards power. But most people don't do that, and most people stay at the bottom of the rung for one simple reason. They don't have a big enough connection to something bigger than themselves. When you make it all about you, yeah, life is very limited. 
when you make it all about the fact that, hang on, there's an intelligence that beats my heart 100,000 times a day that clearly loves me, otherwise it, it wouldn't do it. Yeah, there's a there's an incredible yeah, planet that's been created for me to come and play on. Yeah, I'm, I'm part of something bigger. Yeah, Tony Robbins taught me a phrase a long time ago. He said, power moves to those in direct proportion to their willingness to serve. And while you're running around making it all about me, 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 life is going to give you feedback, which is going to be, yeah, your life sucks, your life sucks, your life sucks. Stress, stress, stress. The second you start shifting out of that pattern, you start making it all about what you can contribute, not what you can take. You become more ethnocentric, not egocentric. Life starts lining up in your favor. And that's a decision that one has to make. And if you don't have the courage to do it, well, then, you know, keep on the path you've got until you've had enough feedback to try to probably make the choice. Again, some people need to hit their head a few times on the pavement before they realize that, you know, their shoelaces are untied. Yeah, sometimes it's, yeah, your second mild heart attack before you start changing your diet. Sometimes it's the third failed marriage before you realize that, yeah, love is not conditional. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And sometimes, yeah, like you say, you fail those um, tests in earth school, as you say. Um, but that seems like a, a great place to end. Where can people sort of find out more information about you and more about what you teach? Uh, well, uh, my website, petersage.com, is uh, uh, always the go-to place for stuff like that. I also have a YouTube channel with a lot of great content on it. I try and give as much content for free as I can to, to help as many people. Uh, and I also have a book coming out uh, very, very shortly. In fact, by the time this gets published, probably out called The Inside Track, which uh, journeys my um, journey last year, which was uh, quite an incredible journey. So, yeah, as you probably know, and uh, everything that I used and all the tools that I used on how to be able to do that. And it is a practical how-to guide or manual for how to conquer adversity. Yeah, yeah excellent. Well, we'll link that down in, just in the description. But thanks very much for coming on the show. Well, this is mine. Thank you, yeah. Luke. You're doing great work. Yeah. But yeah, thanks very much for that, Peter. Yeah, the, the podcast over. But yeah, thanks very much. And personally, thank you for all the contribution you've made to my life um, and helping me get to yeah, where I am. No, no worries at all. It's uh, you know, say ple ple pleasure's mine, and uh, I'll uh, I'll watch your progress with great interest from here. Yeah, okay, yeah, no worries, and I hope to be on the master circle at some point in the future. Not a doubt in my mind, you will be. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Peter. Have a lovely day. Thanks, okay, you too. Bye bye.